Good morning. Oh, I can't hear you. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's better. That's better. Always like to hear your voices. You know, we're beginning our second week in our series. John's been already mentioning it, Act Out, Acting Out Acts. It's on the screen there. And I'd just like to say to you that if you reserved your books and uh, you haven't picked them up yet, they're back there on the table out there. And uh, just there's, we got one that hasn't been claimed yet. Okay. Um, back there. And you can, you can uh, just pull the tab off and put your deposit in the envelope there. They're $5. And I think John was trying to tell me there's one book that hasn't been sold. No books. Okay. All have been sold. And if you reserved one, hopefully they're back there, okay, for you. And uh, we encourage you to pick it up. If you're not going to use, use that book and you reserve one, please let us know. Somebody else may want to use it instead. So we would appreciate that very much. You know, this series is really designed to encourage us and uh, to encourage us to be what God has called us to be. You know, we come to church for a lot of reasons. We, we fellowship, we come together, we fellowship, we come together, we worship, we come together, we pray, we come together, we hear teaching or whatever. But we also come to meet with other believers for encouragement. How many of you can say, I never, ever need any encouragement? Huh? That's not me, because I need encouragement in life. I, it just is good to hear somebody come up and give encouragement in life. And in Hebrews 10.25, it says, it says this, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And hopefully... When you go around and you shake somebody's hand, you feel a little encouraged. You know, it's even better if somebody slaps you on the back and says, good to see you, Stuart, you know, this morning. It makes you feel like you're welcomed, you belong here, or whatever. And that we come to be encouraged, but not just to be encouraged because we're here, but to be encouraged in Christ, to be encouraged as the body of Christ. And one of the things that we have done, we designed this atlas that I was just talking about a few minutes ago to help us to remember um, what we're working on in our Christian walk and in our Christian life. There's a place in here for sermon notes. I saw some people had it out last week, and they were writing notes down. And uh, there's a place in here six days a week for to just to, to do some a few minutes of meditation every day on what we're studying in the passage of Scripture and also a reading so that you, by the end of this, you have read through the whole book of Acts. And I know that on Tuesday of this week, I um, had to pull out my card, and I like this little card here because I can lay it right aside of the scripture and I can say, okay, which one of these meditations am I going to apply in my life? And uh, so I, I was looking at that and I thought, wow, you know, it says to, on Tuesday, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and the, and the method that I chose on Tuesday was the pronouncement method. But you, if you remember that, will receive power, when I, but you will receive, and he emphasized every word as you say through it. And I was thinking about receive the Holy Spirit, and you'll have, when he comes upon you, and, and uh, recognizing that this is what I have. And then on Wednesday, when we had our staff meeting, the person leading our staff meeting shared that on that morning, when they looked at Acts 1, 9 through 11, they used the picture it method. And that's when Jesus ascended into heaven. And they talked about the, how they would have felt if they would have been there. They pictured it. They put themselves in that situation, the feelings that they would have. And I noticed that I also knew that on that, that very morning, as this person was sharing that, that one other staff member had already told me that they used that same method for that Sunday, for that day on Wednesday. I used the same one as well. So it was very easy to relate that we were all trying to be there, picture it to be a part of it. And then the other thing is, you know, we can come to church and then we come back the next week and if we're doing a series and we go, oh, I was supposed to do that or I was supposed to think about that. I was supposed to do this. And then we come back the third week. Oh, you know, that's why in this book there's a place to write something down and to do it during the week. And to accumulate those things so that when we come back, we could say, yes, I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm doing those things. Last week, as we talked about waiting and uh, a little bit about that, 
and the importance of prayer, one of the things that Pam and I decided to do, our action step was this, that every time we pray together, we're going to mention a number of people that we know that need Jesus Christ. So when we're praying before a meal, we stop and we pray for the lost. That's just part of our praying time. Yet the other night, last night, we were in a restaurant. Part of that praying time was praying for a couple people who were lost. And uh, just being trying to be more passionate about those who need Jesus Christ. And that's what the church needs to come together and have that kind of heart. Because as we consider the subject of revival in the church. You know what revival is? It's putting life back into something that once had life. And the church often has this form of life, but it really isn't alive in Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, my entire life I've prayed for revival in the church. And I mentioned that last week about how God kind of has revealed to me that if you want revival, you've got to be concerned for the lost. You've got to be passionately praying for the lost. And then I came across this revival, this letter, this article, I should say, written by Charles Finney. Any, I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Charles Finney. Charles Finney in the early 1800s was one of the great revivalists, second great awakening kind of guy in this country, when this country just turned on fire for the Lord again. And, and he was an, an attorney who um, accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord. He became then a... An evangelist, he started preaching, he became a pastor, he became a professor of theology and an author, and God seemed to use him wherever he went that he would go and he would preach, and the fire of heaven would seem to fall down on those places. And he wrote this about this whole concept of waiting and the spirit of prayer, praying passionately for the lost. He said, there are two kinds of means required to, to promote a revival. The one to influence men the other to influence God. The truth is employed to influence men, speaking of the word of God, and prayer to move God. When I speak of moving God, I do not mean that God's mind is changed by prayer or that his disposition or character is changed, but prayer produces such a change in us so God can do what he wants to do. He said, when a sinner repents, That state of feeling makes it proper for God to forgive him. God has always been ready to forgive him on that condition. So that when the sinner changes his feelings and repents, it requires no change of feeling in God to pardon him. In other words, God is already there. He already wants that to happen. And I was thinking about that. I brought along this little piece of hose with me. And... uh, I've been spending a lot of time lately on the end of a hose. (laughs) Pam's flowers, every night we go out and we water them and we water them. She's got quite a few of them and it takes quite a while to water them. But what what I notice though is every once in a while when I'm I'm watering, I start to notice that the, the, the flow seems to get less. And then, then I notice a lot of times it just stops. And you know what happens? This little hose gets a kink in it, and it shuts off the water, the hose does. And you know, that's the way it is what Finney is saying, God is already forgiven. But it's when the person comes into alignment with God, God doesn't change. The person needs to change. And the same thing is true with us. So often we're not experiencing the power of God because we are in control. We're pulling, and we need to let go and to let God work through us, to have his power flow through us. And and he was saying that in regard to the sinner, but he's also talking about the church as well. He says, prayer is in a chain of causes that leads to a revival. Many zealously preach the gospel to cause people to turn around, but have laid too little weight on prayer. They preached eagerly, talked to individuals, handed out leaflets, but in their surprise, with little success. In other words, they're out there doing it, but they're not seeing any success. And he says the reason why they could not achieve more was because they neglected the other form of support, which is fervent prayer. They forgot that the truth itself has no effect without the Spirit of God. 
And he said, a revival may be expected when Christians have the spirit of prayer for a revival. But when they feel the want of revival, they pray for it. They feel for their own families and neighborhoods. They pray for them as if they could not be denied. The spirit of prayer is a state of continual desire and anxiety of mind for the salvation of sinners. It is something that weighs them down. A Christian who has this spirit of prayer feels anxious for souls. He thinks of it by day. He dreams of it by night. In other words, this is consuming that people would know Christ. And then he said, but this deep, continual, earnest desire for the salvation of sinners is what constitutes the spirit of prayer for a revival. When this feeling exists in a church, unless the spirit is grieved away by sin, there's kinks in the hose, there will infallibly be a conversion of sinners to God. This burning desire increases more and more until revival comes. And so it starts with this desire, this burning desire for the souls of men. Last week we mentioned 120, fervently praying for 10 days. And I said they weren't praying about a lot of things we pray about. They were praying that God's will would be done through them, that they would have this fervent desire for the souls of men, that the Spirit of God would fall upon them. They weren't praying about health and all these other things. They were praying for people, for the souls of men. And we kind of set that scene up with a little video. You might remember it. Remember that Mark came sitting there in front of the mirror, and he was kind of saying, you can do it, you can do it. Get out there. You could do it. He was this actor, and he was talking to himself. You know your lines. You're prepared. You can do it. And then it showed him walking out on the platform, and the lights came on, and he stood there, and he went, oh, oh, oh. And he stared up in the lights, and he couldn't remember his lines. And the video ended with him back in his dressing room, looking in the mirror, feeling like a failure. And then he heard that the director wanted to see him. Well, I, uh, here, you wanted to talk to me? That's right. I wanted to talk to you about the upcoming show. Oh. Really? Yes. I saw your audition. Yeah, I'm really sorry about that. It, it wasn't very good. I could have done better. Really, I could have. Do you want to hear something else? Some Shakespeare? No, no, I've I've heard enough. All right. Where are you going? I wasn't finished yet. Huh? You have the part. What? What do you mean? I've heard enough because I've seen you behind the scenes. You've got your lines all down. You've got what it takes. I know you can do it. You have the part. I I don't, I don't understand. Mark, you have everything you need to succeed in this role. The only thing you were missing was a director. Now that you have the part in my show, I'm here to help you along the way. Will you let me help you? Oh, oh yes. Uh, I want to play my part well. And uh, you're right. I'm going to need your help. That's what I'm here for. This show is so important to me. I'll be with you every step of the way, as much as you will let me help you. Now, that's a little modern parable of what we're going to talk about today. You see, you got what it takes. You got what it takes. There's not a person in here that, you, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you got what it takes to go out and to play your part in life that God has given you. 
You got it. But what you need in your life is the divine director. And we're going to talk this morning and see a little bit about this divine director, the God of the church age, the Holy Spirit that God has given us. Jesus said about him in John 14, 6, you see it up there on the screen, 16, 7, that he is another counselor. In other words, what he's saying, he's, coming, he's going to be this director. He's going to give you counsel. He's going to give you guidance. He's going to help you in life. You see, and then he said he's another. Why would he say that? Because that he's going to be just like Jesus. Because when Jesus walked here on this earth, he gave counsel to his followers. He gave direction to them. He showed them the way. He taught them. And he said, look, there's another counselor coming. And this counselor... And he said that he will be the spirit of truth, John 14, 7. He will guide you in all truth, John 16, 3. And then he does this part. He convicts the world of sin. He will convict the world of sin. It's what the Holy Spirit does. The third person of the Holy Trinity. We find him in creation. We find him inspiring the prophets of God. The disciples... They knew about the Holy Spirit. They knew because of what Jesus taught them. They knew because in the Old Testament that they knew the Old Testament writers like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Samuel. They were full of God's Spirit, the Scripture teaches us. They knew about the Spirit of God because men like Samson, the Spirit of God would come upon him and he would do fantastic physical feats. In his life, they knew about the Spirit of God, but they didn't know the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God has yet to come into them and for them to know him. Now, last week I noted that Jesus created this tension, this anticipation for the next great act of God. Now, when God has done things historically where things dramatically change, he does it in a big way. For instance, when Moses went up on the mount, Mount Sinai, God did it in a big way. There was lightning, peals of lightning, thunder, all kinds of things going on. God was given the law. Now God is going to give grace to man, and he's sending out his truth through grace. And we're going to find that he is going to do this in a big and an unusual kind of way. So if you have your Bibles this morning... I'm going to ask that you would turn to Acts chapter 2. And we need to read this passage of Scripture because this is God raising the curtain. The, the, he, Jesus set the anticipation. The disciples were expecting something great to happen, but yet to see it. And it tells us there in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. I just want to stop there for a minute and make a comment. The NIV and some of the modern translations, I think, weaken this passage because they just use the word together, okay? The word, if you go back and you study the word, the word together there has a much greater meaning than we might associate with it. Because, see, we could say, well, we're all together here in this room this morning. We're all together right? We're here. We're in this room. We all met together. And we could assume that's what they meant. They were all in this room together. But it, do, it means more than that. What the word meant there is that it was, they were, um, there was this oneness of mind, heart, and purpose. That everyone, yeah, physically was together, but they were all on the same mental purpose. They were all on the same track. They were all thinking the same way. I've often wondered what this church would be like if that was true when we came to worship God, or we came to a Sunday morning worship, because it's never been true. You say, what? We all came here to worship God. Look, I stood in the back. I've walked the aisles. I look around at times. Not everybody is doing it. Not everybody is worshiping God. Not everybody is engaged during the message or the truth. It, not everybody, but they said everybody. They were all together. And can you imagine if we were all in the same mind, had the same purpose, that we were full, locked in, our hearts were all locked in, and what we wanted to do. And they were there, and they 
came together in this kind of a way for not just an hour on Sunday morning, but for 10 days, this togetherness was happening and happening and growing greater in them. And it says, suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And it only happened in this house. And it wasn't a mighty wind. It only was like a mighty wind. And it was a sound, okay, like a mighty wind. So you hear the wind rushing. That's what was coming from this house. And it says that they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. So the tongue of fire came on the community and it separated onto the individuals in that community. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, the Greek word there for tongues is language. And when it says that they were filled, it means that they were totally immersed in the Spirit. Just like baptism. Jesus said you will be baptized in the Spirit. When we baptize somebody, do we just put their hand in? Do we just put their foot in? Do we put their whole self in? And they were totally immersed. And these they were totally immersed in the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in tongues. Now, why? It's a power that they did not have until this moment. And God's Spirit gave them this power that made them useful. When God gives us something, it is to make us useful in the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God. Not for us to hoard, not for us to say, how good am I? look at me, but to make us useful. And God gave them this to make them useful. Here's what it tells us. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in in bewilderment because of each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they ask, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? You see what they're saying? This doesn't make any sense. They're Galileans. How could they be speaking all these different languages? They're amazed by this. And utterly amazed, they ask, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Pontus, and Asia. Whoops, Phrygia, Pamphylia. Yeah, skip the line there, skip the... Um, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Now listen, these disciples were not ignorant of what was going on around them in their society. They knew that the Feast of Pentecost was coming. They knew that on the Feast of Pentecost, that Jews, devout Jews, it said, from all over the place, all these regions would come to Jerusalem because the Feast of Pentecost was one of the great celebrations in the Jewish year. They knew that. And I think that they were praying not only for for those 10 days, for those people that were living in Jerusalem, they were praying for those people that were going to come to Jerusalem. And they were praying earnestly that somehow they could reach him because they, I think that they knew that just think if we could get a couple converts from over there in, in Asia someplace or down there in Libya someplace and they would take the news of Jesus back. It's like Jesus told us in Acts 1.8. And they knew this. And they were praying about it. But they didn't speak their language. And so they... On this day, God gives them the ability to speak to every one of these regions that are mentioned here, to speak in their own language, and to speak of the wonders of God. And what's the wonders of God? Oh, creation. All the, no, no, no. Somebody reminded me after the early service. You know what the greatest wonder of God is? The forgiveness of your sins. God forgives you and invites you into eternity with him. It's still a wonder how one man dying on the cross can forgive all of our sins, isn't it? And they spoke 
of this. And we're going to see that's what Peter spoke about here as they were filled with the Holy Spirit. A number of months ago, I was praying about this and I was praying about the, this and it occurred to me that I need to ask God for this gift. You say, what tongues? I need to ask God for the language of people outside of the church. I need to ask God that I can speak on the level of people that I meet. To be able to speak right to them, to help them to understand the wonder of God. You see, because there's nobody speaks a different language around me much. But there are a lot of people who need to know the message of Jesus Christ who don't ch speak churchies. You see, and we got to be able to speak their language to them. We got to be able to relate to where they are. We got to know their region that they're coming from so that we could touch them with the message of Jesus Christ like these men did. Now, some, it says, however, made fun of them and said they have too much wine. Listen, that's always going to happen. People are always going to make fun. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what they, was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he takes these devout Jews back to the Old Testament. And he says to them, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And that's what was happening at that moment. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming in the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, wait a minute. We can look at it and say, wait a minute, is this all happening at one time? It's not. It's a prophecy. The great coming day of the Lord hasn't happened, okay, yet. The sky, as it says here, the moon hasn't turned to blood. Here, when you're a prophet in the Old Testament, you're looking way in the future, okay? And it's like you're just seeing these mountaintops in the future. And as you look in the future, if you've ever traveled out west or anything, and you look and say, Oh, there's two mountains right there, you know. They look real close together. What happens when you get closer? They're further apart. They're miles apart. There's days' journey sometimes apart between them. And the prophet only could see from a distance the top of the mountain. And so we see that this, he's talking here about what's going to happen in this church age. And he says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, Wonders and signs. See, why did Jesus do them? It says right there. He was accredited to the people by these things. Did among you him, as you yourself know, this man was handed over to you by God, set, sets purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave. David is speaking of himself. Now listen, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. And he's talking about the Messiah. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. And David, he goes on to explain, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. His tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what, what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact, exalted to the right hand of the God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. For David did not descend, ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. And after they heard all this, it says down in verse 37, they were cut to their hearts. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. 
They were cut to their hearts, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Now, what Peter did is he stood up and talked their language to them. He took them back to the Old Testament. They understood the Old Testament. And he talked their language to them. And they talked to them about Jesus. And they asked them, their first question was, what does this mean? The second question is, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Now listen to me. This is a message that's true today. Jesus died for your sins, and he offers you salvation. He calls to you this very morning, and he beckons you. He offers you his forgiveness. Are you going to line your life with him and receive it? And so this is the offer that God makes. And it is the offer that he commands us to make. And it tells us later that there were 3,000 saved that day. You know, I figured that out. That means for everyone in the upper room, 25 people came to Christ. In 10 days. It's a mighty work of God that he had done here. It all started because, number one, of the waiting. You see, these are the steps that we have to take still today. We have to wait. We need to be passionately praying for the salvation of the lost. The second thing is the infilling. Passionately asking God for that presence, that power of the Holy Spirit. Did you note that that power came upon them not when they were out there witnessing That power came upon them first when they were assembled together. And then they went and witnessed. That's what it took, that oneness in mind and that oneness in spirit that happened. The third thing is when they were waiting and they were praying and the infilling happened, then they made the connection. They went out and they spoke the truth of God. They spoke the truth of God powerfully. They spoke it in love. They spoke it so that all could understand. And God is saying to us, when it says here, and for all who are far off, he's talking about us far off, thousands of years later. This is a truth that needs to be shared even this day. A connection that needs to be made. And so this waiting this infilling that we're talking about today that we need to be seeking, that's a submission to his power. We go out and then we connect, which we're going to talk about in the future, but it's the Holy Spirit who convicted. Because that's what Jesus said the Holy Spirit does. In verse 36, Peter's voice was the instrument. Verse 37, the Spirit convicted. And in verse 37, they ask, brothers, what must we do? They were cut in their heart. And then we find in verse 41 the result, 3,000 saved. You see, the curtain had parted. God is now showing what he wants them to do, what he wants all of us to do, because God is willing that none would perish. And we should ask ourselves, what can we learn from this? Number one, passionately pray for the lost. More, maybe it's the greatest thing on your, your prayer list, greater than anything else, that you have more people that you're praying for. And your heart is breaking for them. And as I said, pray that God would let you see where they would go in eternity. Get your heart broke for them. And secondly, surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we got to realize Like Finney said, 
You can go out and hand out tracts. You can share the truth. You can give the four spiritual laws. You can do the Roman road. But if you are lacking in prayer and lacking in the Spirit of God, you're going to see no results. But God wants us to be filled with His Spirit. And note this. The first sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit is not tongues. It is not prophecy. It is not knowledge. It is not healing. The first sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit is witnessing. Acts 1.8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my... He didn't say anything else. He didn't say you're going to speak in tongues. He didn't say you were going to heal people. He didn't say that. He said, I want you to witness. And you know what? We're a bunch of chickens. We're afraid. God says, no. You're only afraid when you're doing it in your power. Let my power come upon you and go out and to witness for me. To your co-workers, to the people that you work. Live for me so that others may come to know me. And it's the Holy Spirit who makes us useful. It is the Holy Spirit that makes us useful. It is His Spirit that makes us useful. Paul, when the Corinthians were arguing over, well, I'm saved because of Apollos, or I'm saved because of Paul, he wrote them and he said, what after all is Apollos? What after all is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each his task. I planted a seed, Apollos watered it, but who made it grow? It's God. It's the Holy Spirit. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God makes things grow. We are God's water in cans. God wants us to be filled with his spirit and to slosh it all over the place. But we are also supposed to be the planters and the waterers. I mean, the planters, we are, we're his watering can, but it is only the spirit that brings results. When we stand before God, it's going to be how much we watered, how much we planted. Were we filled with the spirit? Did the spirit is the, is the one who brings the results. But there are no results if no one's planting. There's no results if no one's watering. And we need to be doing that in our life. So here, here's the action step. Last week, the action step was to just, I tried to say this to you, start praying fervently for the lost. I, I just can't imagine that if everybody who came to this church, every day we were praying for the lost the oneness in mind that would suddenly come upon us, the, the power, the presence of God, because we're praying for what God wants. Jesus came not to heal people and do all those other things. He came to save the lost. That's why he came. And if we were praying, that was action step last week. This week, if we just began to seek the power, the filling of the Holy Spirit, God, I want to powerfully live for you. Just make that. I have that on your mind all the time. Because what will happen is God will begin to show us where we got kinks in the hose. Because, see, you know what? I can have 60 pounds of city of Marshall pressure behind this hose. But if I got one of these, nothing here. And what we need to see is where is it in our life that we're causing the kink that God's power is not flowing through us. And this is surrendering to his will. Surrender to him and allow his power to flow. I just want to pray this morning. Would you just join me? God, I'm passionate about this because I realize, God, how passionate you are about it. Lord, we call that Passion Week because it shows us your passion that you have for each and every one of us. Lord, I just pray for this church that we would get passionate, God, about the salvation of souls. And Lord, we would get passionate, Lord, to be powerfully filled with your Spirit. 
that, God, we would become a place that rejoices as we see others know you. That we would be like these disciples, God. Now, Lord, I have an erred sometimes, praying, saying, do it again, God. Lord, that was for then. This is today. And we just need to, Lord, surrender and let you do what you want to do today through us. And so, Father, we pray for our friends, our neighbors, those who are on our mind right now, that they would come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And I pray, Father, that this would be a congregation that we are filled, overwhelmed by your spirit, your power, your presence. Cleanse us, God. Show us the kinks, what's ever in the way. And then lastly, Lord, I pray for that person that might be here this morning that doesn't know you. They know all about you. They've never surrendered their life to you. God, may this be the day for them. Holy Spirit, bring them, and may they respond to your conviction. I wouldn't go out that door without knowing him today. And if you would like to know Christ as your Savior and Lord, you can just simply say, Lord, I want you as my Savior and Lord. I know that I am full of sin. I've gone my own way. Today, I turn from that. I turn to you. And I receive you as my Savior. Cleanse me. Thank you. I'm clean. Give me new life. Thank you. I have it. Because I believe in you. With the lights down and no one else looking around, if you prayed that today to receive Christ as your Savior and Lord, would you just kind of lift your hand up for a moment just so I can pray for you this week? Is anybody here? You receive Christ? Never have done that before, but you're going to do it today. And so this morning as we wrap this service up, we want to just ask that we would be filled with the Spirit of God, carry out His purpose in our life as we sing together.